Hi, everyone. Hello and welcome to our program this evening. I'm Stephanie Gaspar, president of Kissimmee Valley Audubon Society and appreciate everyone watching. I want to give a special thanks to Dan Dunwoody for joining us. Hello and welcome to our program this evening. Oh, one I'm moment. I'm hearing an echo. Kissimmee Valley Audubon Society and appreciate everyone watching. I had a little echo again, but I fixed that, oh, so I apologize. Great. Great. I want to give a special thanks to Dan Dunwoody for joining us last month to talk about his butterfly farm and operations in Kissimmee. And if you have an opportunity to visit, I would contact him so he could set up a group visit because it's an amazing location. And it was a great program and very interesting to learn about what he does. If you haven't seen it yet, be sure to check it out on our YouTube channel. Don't forget to like and subscribe to be notified of updates. I have a few chapter announcements. Last month, we tabled at the Osceola Spring Market Festival. It was a beautiful day, and I want to thank everyone who came over to the table and chatted with us, grabbed pamphlets, and signed up for our email list. It was really nice to see everyone in person again. Next month, we have elections and hope that you're interested. So please reach out if you have any questions. We will be sending out emails and notifications on Facebook soon with more details. No experience is necessary, and we look forward to having diverse members of our community reflected on our board. Our email is in the description below, so please send a message if someone you know is interested. Before we begin, I would like to mention a few housekeeping items. Log into YouTube and type any questions you have in the chat. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. If we have any connection problems or an echo problem, please be assured we will fix work on fixing it as soon as possible. I'm happy to introduce tonight's guest, Larry Rosen. The last time he was our guest, he presented amazing sights from his trip in Africa. Tonight, he will share pictures from his time in Ecuador. Larry has found he loves the color, sound, and species diversity of the South American tropics, but lowland forests Rainforests can be very hot and humid day after soggy day. In January 2020, he and his wife, Roz, went on a small group guided birding trip to the Andes Mountains in Ecuador. The weather was comfortable and the birding was great. The group's bird list included 51 hummingbird species and 57 kinds of tanager among 298 total species. Larry retired five years ago as a Valencia College Research Analyst. He is a past longtime president of Kissimmee Valley Audubon Society and is still a board member. He and his wife like to travel and wildlife viewing is one of their vacation priorities. Ever the rebel, he is still using a camera with a mirror inside. Thank you very much for joining us this evening, Larry. I look forward to seeing your presentation and I will now pass it over to you. Okay, thanks, Stephanie. So, um, let's see. Okay. So, uh, so as uh, Stephanie said, um, in January of 2020, just before the pandemic, we did a trip to South to uh, South America to Ecuador. It was a, a guided birding trip through the Partnership for International Birding. Um, we were just, uh, our group just consisted of one other couple and our guide was Leles Navarrete. Um, and um, he was an excellent guide and um, I recommend the trip if it's, uh, if it's available. Um, so I'm gonna begin here. This, this uh, scene here on the, on the opening slide is, um, is the Antasana volcano in the Andes, uh, it's the summit there is 18,000 feet. And uh, so we were probably at around 10 or 11,000 here. Uh, and this is one of the, this is the first day we were birding on this trip. So, um, okay. let me get my bearings here. Okay, so here's the uh, here's the map of of where we went, and you can see um, we started out. Well, we we flew into Quito right here, where where the number one is, and um, the first day we came down to to 
this area here on the sun where, where you saw the volcano. But after that, we went up towards to the uh, west, northwest of Quito and um, into basically the Mindo area and stayed there for several days, for a bunch of days, and then worked our way back across. We actually stayed in Quito one night on the way back. Uh, we worked our way back across the Andes and uh, went to um, an area all the way down here at number seven, which is San Isidro. And uh, so that's the basic outline of the trip uh, as far as where we went. You see it's numbered one, two, three, four, five, and then six, seven, six and seven. Um, and these are the names of the places over here. Um, and one thing you need to know about the Andes, it's not just uh, like one chain of mountains. It's actually two of them close together there, where there's like, it's like two peaks um, with a, with a central valley that's also high up. Uh, Quito's in that valley and its altitude varies from about 5,000 to 9,000 feet. But um, the, the real heights of the Andes are on either side of it. And our birding was main, mainly um, on, well, we um, spent the first part of the trip mostly over here on the west side of the Andes uh, slopes and then came down to the east. Um, so, okay. Uh, this is um, the name of the, well, this is the first area, Antasana. Uh, it's, it's a biological reserve, the ecological reserve. This is the bird that we saw there, a southern lapwing. This bird's very common in the southern hemisphere. It's, um, it's in the plover family, as are all the lapwings. But as far as I know, this is the only lapwing species in South America. Uh, there are lots of lapwings in, in Africa. This is our first hummingbird that we saw. Um, first of many, I might say. And uh, so uh, this is a sparkling violet deer. Here's a black-tailed train bearer. This was, uh, there's like six species of long-tailed hummingbirds in South America. And we actually saw four of them on this trip and you'll see pictures of them. The other ones are, the two of them are sylphs, S-Y-L-P-H, sylph species. And um, this one's a train bearer. And there's other ones called racket tails. Uh, this is the first lodge we stayed at for for more than a few more than one night, um, Settimo Paraiso, and it was a great place. Really uh, tuned for uh, nature, nature hiking and uh, birding. It's one of the birds we saw there, a blue and yellow tanager. We saw, as, as you may have seen in the publicity, we saw fifty seven different species of tanager. There's actually about 73, 73 or 74 species of tanager in Ecuador alone. Uh, hummingbirds, we saw 51 species, and there's, I don't know, a lot, a lot more than that. Here's a female Andean emerald. And a white-necked Jacobin. There's a lot of hummingbirds. <laughs> Uh, here's a here's a video. It shows you what it gives you an idea of the the speed of those of the hummingbirds uh, going to the feeders and the flowers and. Uh, which I have to contend with if you're trying to photograph them or even see them with binoculars really well. Uh, but we're just standing there and there's, I don't know, dozens in this scene. I'm gonna play it again. Okay. 
And uh, this is one of the birds we saw there, a silver-throated tanager eating banana. We saw a golden olive woodpecker, golden naped tanager, green crowned brilliant. Brilliant is one of the categories of hummingbird. Orange belly euphonia. Red headed barbette. Uh, the barbettes, um, there's several, there's a bunch of uh, different barbette species in South America. And there's, I was surprised to find in South Africa that there are a couple of barbette species there too. This guy has some personality. It's a male. And here's a female of the same species. Kind of unusual that a female is probably probably just as colorful as the male as the male is. Hmm. Here's a gold, golden tanager. Here's a blue neck tanager. Uh, by the way, these are all my pictures, unless I tell you otherwise. And um, these pictures were taken with my Nikon D500. In the publicity, I made a little joke about having a camera with a mirror still in it because it's a single lens reflex camera and it's not mirrorless like the new mirrorless cameras, which are doing incredible things for people. But I don't have that yet. Here's a blue neck tanager, in case I didn't say that yet. This is the male Andean em emerald. I showed you a female a little bit earlier, which, all, which was all green. Well, mostly green, had some, um, had some blue on it. Fawn-breasted brilliant. And here's one of the sylphs. Um, on this trip, we saw two different species of sylph. There was this uh, violet-tailed sylph, and uh, this is on the western side of the Andes. On the other side, this a very similar bird, more blue than purple, but it's um, also a sylph. It's called the long-tailed sylph, and you'll see a picture of that later when we get over to the east side. This is another one of the long-tailed species. Uh, this is a white-booted racquetail. Apparently the species has been split. Uh, there was a, the booted racquetail has apparently been split into the white booted, which is on the west side of the Andes and the Peruvian racquetail, which is on the east side. And you'll see the Peruvian later. It's the yellow-throated toucan. It was way out in the distance, but I like it too much to not include the picture. This is a view, um, we stopped at a, a restaurant and this is a view from the back patio of the restaurant, Rio Blanco. Um, we went to a place called Refugio Paz de las, de las Aves. And um, so basically it means peace or peace refuge of the birds and um, we saw some really interesting things there. The, uh, the one on the left, this uh, bird, um, this painting of a bird is one of the ant pittas. And the one on the right is the famous Andean cock of the rock. And we managed to see both of those on this visit. And you'll see that later too. This is one of our first views of the Andean cock of the rock. We were out at about 6.30 in the morning. Uh, it was pretty dark and we were at a blind uh, viewing into this part of the forest. There was actually a lek going on. Um, lek is spelled L-E-K and a lek is a breeding, kind of a breeding frenzy of, uh, of, the, of the birds. Um, and so, but mostly the views of them, of them were hidden in the, in the jungle, it's very dense. And we're only able to get kind of windows to look through. And this was 
taken with my 600 millimeter lens. And, um, <clears throat> and this is not, so this is one of the first pictures I got. <clears throat> and apparently my voice always leaves me when I do these presentations. <laughs> um, this was just a close up I got, um, not a very good one, but uh, you can see the beak of this, I guess a young male doesn't have all those orange feathers above its beak where you normally can't even see the beak of the species. So he was probably eating something and I just thought to include this so you could see where the beak actually is in this bird because when you see an adult male, it looks like this. And uh, so this is the, uh, it's very difficult to get this picture. I had the ISO cranked way up to about 2000 or more. And this is still at about probably 1 15th of a second, 1 30th of a second. I was lucky to get this one where the bird stood kind of still. Um, so. Okay, so this is in the refugio uh, also. And this is also kind of early in the morning. This is after we saw the, the, the cock of the rock. And um, so believe it or not, there's a bird in this picture. It's a lyre tailed night jar. If you're, if you're familiar with night jars, they're, um, they're night flyers, they're insect, they're birds that catch insects on the wing, mostly at night. And during the day, they kind of hide and they're camouflaged. And so, if you haven't spotted it yet, it's right here. This is a rather large night jar called a lyre tailed night jar. And this is a close up, believe it or not. It's still hard to see. Of course, it was very dark there. So, this, so there's a lot of grain in the picture. But you can see the eyes here and the beak and the tail hanging down here. So this is a, these are dark backed wood, wood quail. Um, <clears throat> I didn't have to do anything to get them to pose like this except wait. Um, this uh, preserve, uh, they've developed in recent years, they've developed a way to get, uh, to make it, make these, these um, birds of the forest floor uh, more accessible to photographers and other people who want to see them. And they, what they do, they, they've actually trained the birds sort of, they go out in the morning and they put bait uh, like uh, worms and grain on the floor of the, of the woods there. And then there, you know, the people, people come to see them and the birds have learned that they're gonna be safe coming out for a couple minutes and grabbing some food. So, um, if, if they didn't do that, you'd be uh, taking numerous trips to this uh, this place, uh, to, to places like this, uh, before you got even one picture of any of these forest floor birds, because they're so, they're so cryptic, they hide so well. Um, so this place and some other place, and some other places we were have, uh, found a way to get them more available to people. This is the giant ant pitta. And uh, this is the, the biggest one, the biggest ant pitta that uh, is in this location. Uh, it's still only about, uh, probably about six inches tall. So here's a video of the giant ant pitta. Thank you. 
And so that day we also saw a summer tanager. This is a bird that's um, we see migrating through Florida and other parts of the East Coast, and uh, it it winters in the northern U.S. and Canada and parts of Canada. It's summer. It's summers in the U northern U.S. and parts of Canada. It uh, winters in South America and I think Central America. So it's not crowned anpita. These are this is a small bird. Just a few inches high. Another small one, yellow breasted ant pitta. And this is probably the smallest, um, a little tiny ochre breasted ant pitta. Very cute. Here's a white winged brush finch. This is a collared irisari. Irisaris are a smaller version of a toucan. Um, the toucan family consists of toucans, <clears throat> irisaris, and toucanets. And this is a collared irisari. Green thorntail, small hummingbird. We were lucky to see this bird, just chestnut winged mannequin. And um, mannequins are a really interesting uh, group of birds in the tropics. And uh, they, uh, they have very interesting breeding uh, rituals, breeding um, dis displays. Uh, you've probably seen some on TV if you watch nature shows. Um, a lot of the mannequins, the males uh, team up, they have uh, a, a mature male and an immature male that uh, that do a dance together to try to attract a female, which only the mature male gets to gets to mate with. But this uh, this mannequin does a display all on its own, and it has um, an interesting adaptation to its wing wing bones that um, make it a very poor flyer. Uh, these males can't fly well at all. Their bones are heavier than other birds. Um, their wing bones are heavier than, than those of other birds to enable it to do this display. And, um, and so it's basically, uh, they, they are able to rub some structures in their wings together to make this sound. So, so you wouldn't have to uh, guess at what it sound like, sounds like. I'm gonna show you a video from the Cornell Bert, uh, Cornell uh, Lab of Ornithology. That's cool. So um, this is a smooth bill um, it's a It's a bird actually in the cuckoo family. And uh, we do have some, some uh, smooth billed anis in South Florida. Uh, and they're, they're in Cuba, they're in other parts of Latin America. I'm not sure of the exact total range. Um, I guess they go pretty far into South America. 
Uh, we did a hike up to this farm. It was very muddy. They gave us boots uh, to use. And uh, I didn't take my big camera because I was afraid I would slip. You can see people using hiking poles, which I don't use or haven't used. I actually did slip about two feet, but didn't fall. But I didn't have my big camera. So when we uh, came up to where the large wattled umbrella bird was, uh, Janet, who was on our trip, um, she uh, took a picture and uh, sent me this picture afterwards. This is one of the kind of iconic birds in that area. Very unusual. This that wattle is huge. It's um, probably about six inches long, and just and it's um, there's another umbrella bird species that has a wattle too, but it's not that big. Here's the white-tailed trogon. <clears throat> Trogons are a, a, a group of tropical birds, um, kind of closely related to the quetzals. Actually, I think the quetzals are, are trogons. The banana cat, and uh, this is also a widespread bird in the Caribbean and, and, and um, Latin America. Eats mostly fruit and insects. It's the blue gray tanager, uh, another uh, bird that's pretty widespread for in Central and South America. Black cheeked woodpecker. Snipbilled euphonia. Here's a peacock butterfly. Um, the genus is Anartia. I'm not sure of the exact species. It's, uh, there's several species that look very, very similar to each other. Here's a little reptile. Uh, it's, it's an amoeba lizard. Um, they're also called whiptails. He's eating a cricket. Um, this tail was about as long as his body is, um, their, their tails are very long. That's why they're called whip tails. And uh, as you know, some lizards will lose parts of the tails as a defense mechanism. So apparently it gave up the tail, part of its tail at some point. Um, these tails do grow back, but not, as, not the same way they, they grew orig originally. This was outside our lodge, um, a species of red banana that's growing there. This is another early morning picture in the dark, uh, right outside our lodge, way up in a tree. And uh, it's called a little cuckoo. And like most cuckoos, it has a really long tail, but that's mostly blocked by the, by the moss and the, bar and the branch. This is a Pinocchio anole. And I guess the reason it's called Pinocchio is pretty obvious. The pink building behind is part of the lodge, the Settimo Paraiso lodge that we stayed at. And I have another video. This one shouldn't mess up because it's local. Here's a green crown brilliant. A gorgeted sun angel or gorgeted sun angel. I don't know. It's the gorget is this purple thing here. Hummingbirds have a lot of species of hummingbird have gorget, gorgets. Um, 
they're different colors. Um, of course, our, like in the East Coast of the US, we have the ruby-throated hummingbird, which has a kind of a bright ruby red color courgette when the sun hits it properly. And uh, this is a nice bird here, courgetted sun angel. There's a masked flower piercer. Flower piercers have pointed beaks that they can use to rob nectar from flowers. They actually go in at the bottom of the flower without going up, but going around the uh, pollinating parts at the top and uh, can get nectar that way. Another species of flower piercer that actually, uh, the white-sided flower piercer, and you can see that little hook at the end of its top beak, uh, the top of its beak. And um, this one has, some of the flower piercers have beaks that point upwards like this. It helps them get underneath, underneath the bottom of the flower and go right into the bottom where the nectar is. This is the hoary puff leg. It has those puffy, uh, those, those boots, uh, as we call them on the booted racket tails, um, but no racket tail in this species. And this one will be visible in some of the videos I show you in a minute. Like right now, here's a video at one of the places along, along the road, we stopped to watch hummingbirds. Uh, the people, so, uh, people set up um, places like this. Um, They, <clears throat> they stock the hummingbird feeders with with uh, with sugar water, and um, possibly put they put out fruit sometimes for other birds, and uh, they usually have a box where they're where you can where they you put money if you stop by that helps them uh, you know keep things stocked, and uh, you just sit there you just go there, they have chairs and, and sometimes they have blinds where you can sit and watch the birds. And uh, this place is nice too, because it has some, some of the flowers that these birds would use naturally, uh, tubular flowers that hummingbirds like. So here's one of the videos. Again, this, is, this shows you how quick these birds are. This is a sylph right here. And there's a couple other sylphs in this video. I'm gonna show this one quickly again. There's some flower piercers on the left and a sylph, I believe. Okay. And here's a close, more close up look at the at the same place, same location. Okay. Uh, at the same location, they actually had a little blind where you could you kind of walk into a. Uh, a little structure and sat down and a wind, there was a window there and you could see out over this little pond they have and uh, take pictures. And that's where I got this picture. And it looks like this uh, flame-faced tanager has an insect uh, right on the outside of its beak. Maybe part of an insect it already ate, I'm not, I don't know. He saw this bird there also. Uh, we had seen it earlier in the trip at the where we saw the uh, the cock of the rock. It's called a plate billed mountain toucan. One of my favorite birds of the trip, actually. Scarlet bellied mountain tanager.
yellow-breasted brush finch. So uh, then we were finished with our time in the West and uh, we were making our way uh, towards the East across the Andes. And we came to Yanacocha Reserve, which uh, is at around 11,000 feet. And uh, we had lunch up there and we did, a, we did a hike and it was a really great experience. This is part of lunch. Um, and yeah, that's popcorn in the soup. <clears throat> this is actually a potato soup. And um, it was made with two different kinds of potatoes. And if, you if you're not familiar with the origins of potatoes, they, they, potatoes came from the Andes. They were originally bred there. And there are there a couple hundred different kinds of potatoes that, that, the, uh, that, 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 that were grown in the Andes. And a lot of those uh, varieties of potatoes are still available today and grown. And one of the types of potato that they use for the soup liquefies when you cook it. So it forms like a potato broth or potato base for the soup. And then they put popcorn in it, which I never thought of doing with soup, but it was really good. Here's a large bird. It's a kind of chicken-like or turkey-like called the called a guan. There are numerous species of guan in South America and Central America, but uh, this is a high altitude guan that can be found through most of the Andes called the Andean guan. Saw this really cool hummingbird up there called the shining sunbeam really unusual because it doesn't have anything that shines from the front. Uh, all the uh, iridescence is from the back. And these are not real colors, by the way. I mean, it's not uh, colors in the sense that there's pigment. Uh, just about all the hummingbird colors. And for a lot of other birds, some other birds too, um, are actually done by created, the colors are created by refraction um, in tiny structures in the in the in the in the feathers that refract the light in certain ways. It's also true of a lot of the butterflies. Black chested mountain tanager. A lot of there's about five different tanagers that look very similar. Uh, the species diversity is incredible. And when you have um, habitats like this that can support, uh, like that are, that are very good at supporting different species uh, in terms of providing food and everything, uh, you can have several species evolve in the same, just about the same location. Uh, there's, that's why one reason there's so much diversity and in places like rainforests and cloud forests. So it's almost like there's different habitats, like 10 or 20 feet apart from each other. It's, it's that dense sometimes with micro, micro habitats. This is, uh, we started out in this hike, uh, again at 11,000 feet at, at Yanacolcha. And we took this picture. This is on the way, on the hike, one of the views off the trail. It's our little our little group. Uh, by the way, that's one of Raza's famous travel hats. She's got patches on there from from all over the place, and there's a, this is about the fourth hat that she has patches on, I think. We saw this along the way. <clears throat> and I didn't know what it was until I looked it up uh, while I was doing this show, this slideshow. Um, it's one of the species of passion, passion vine, passion flower. 
Um, and this is, it's, there's one in, that grows in Hawaii um, that's introduced into Hawaii that grows crazy there. And they call it the banana polka because it produces a passion fruit that's kind of long, uh, almost like a banana. And um, this might be that species or it's a related species. Here's another hummingbird buff winged star frontlet. It's one of the views we got of the Andes. And then we uh, came, oh, okay. So this is a video from on our way up to Papalakta Pass. This wasn't all the way up, but this is a video that Roz took. This is at the top. This is at 14,000 feet at Papalakta Pass. Um, and while we were up there, we were lucky to see this, which I know doesn't look like a lot to some of you, but uh, this is another ant pit, uh, just like the ones we were looking at on the forest floor. But this one is way out in the open. It's kind of tall. It's about a foot high. And uh, well, let's make that about 10 or 11 inches high. And um, and it just runs across the habitat there, it runs across the, the these uh, mounds of vegetation uh, that that are up there, <clears throat> and uh, for forages for insects and things like that. Another bird was this one, the Plumbia Sierra Finch. These are birds that are only at very high altitude. There's a, we saw another Sierra Finch in Peru that was also at around 13,000 feet. And this one, the many striped Canistero. And then uh, we arrived at one of our later locations on the trip. Uh, which, this is on the all the way on the east side of the Andes. Uh, the uh, the number seven that you saw on the on the map at the beginning, and it was great. We stayed there two or three nights, I think two nights. It was a very nice place, Cabanas San Ysidro, cinnamon flycatcher. Not a hummingbird, this is a, in the flycatcher um, family. And there are a lot of flycatchers in this area too. Uh, probably as many flycatchers as there are hummingbirds or tanagers or, or almost that many. And most flycatchers have this kind of like upright stance. This one's a little puffed out probably because it's at altitude and it's cold, but... Um, You'll see some others. This is not a flycatcher. This is a, this is a trogon. It's a masked trogon that was uh, right outside our lodge at San Isidro. And uh, here's a video that Roz took, I believe. This is a an immature male on the left, trogon. Right. So you heard our guide. This is a female on the right.
So again, that's the immature male. I heard the guide say there were three trogons. I didn't see three. Okay. The pearl tree runner, as the name implies, it just uh, likes to go up and down the branches foraging for, for um, insects and other prey. Olive backed wood creeper. Uh, these uh, wood creepers, there's, wood creepers are a large family of birds that, uh, that you find in, in Central and South America. Uh, they climb trees uh, on the, on the, on the trunk, like you would see woodpeckers do. And in fact, it has a similar, it does it use, it has a similar mechanism where it uses its tail, stiff tail feathers to brace it when it's uh, going up the tree and, and, uh, and perching on the tree. Uh, but they're not related to woodpeckers. They're just, they're uh, their own group of birds. And there's lots of them that, that have different kinds of beaks and different stripe patterns and things like that that are often difficult, difficult to tell apart. They all have the same basic look though. This is a kind of a large, this is a large rodent, the black agouti. It's probably about the size of a house cat. Oops, here's a white-bellied ant pitta. This was at the San Ysidro location. They did a similar thing to the way that the uh, people in Refugio de La Paz, um, Refugio Paz de las Aves um, did. Uh, they, they took us out there in the morning to see this guy. This is a green jay or an Inca jay, same name, other they uh, are called different things. Uh, this bird is actually sometimes seen in the Southern US in Texas and uh, possibly uh, New Mexico, uh, but it's mainly from Mexico into, the, into South America. And it's in the jay family, just like our blue jay. It's in the corvid family, which is that uh, that group of birds. Chestnut breasted coronet, very very handsome little hummingbird. And our guide Lillis just uh, was there on the porch, and uh, one of the chestnut breasted coronets came to visit. Lalas Navarrete, our guy, this guy, the guide we had, this guy, um, he has written, he wrote one of the definitive guides for uh, field guides for Ecuador. It's uh, it's the one I took on the trip with me. Uh, it's very easy to carry because it's a small book. And uh, yeah, I don't know if you can. This one, and uh, so, and uh, it's only that thick. Whereas the other book that I had already bought before that is this big, and it's also a good book. But you don't have to take a book like this on a trip with you. It's very nice. This is a smoke colored peewee. This is another flycatcher, by the way. It sits in the, one of the smaller um, flycatchers. Collared Inca. Hummingbird, of course. 
this one of the clear wing butterflies in the Terranemia genus. When you see SP after a SP uh, after a genus name, it means uh, the person who wrote that isn't sure of the species or didn't want to commit to the species. And if it's plural, like if you're showing a bunch of different butterflies or birds or whatever, you write SPP period. Just for those of you who aren't, who aren't in the biological know. Um, pale edge flycatcher. This is a typical fly, flycatcher stance, very, very straight up and down and alert. And what flycatchers will do, they'll go out. They have what's called hawking behavior. They'll be on the perch, they'll see an insect, they'll go out and catch it on the wing and go and come right back. That's called hawking. Another species of wood creeper. So this one has a beak that's more curved and is a different strike pattern. This is the montane wood creeper. And apparently there's a moth on its leg. Um, I only got a couple of images of this bird. And so I'm not sure if the moth was sitting on its leg or not. And actually right now I'm noticing another moth, another one right over here on the left side of the trunk. So I don't know what's up with the moths. Another flycatcher, golden crown flycatcher. And um, again, I got lucky. The, the bird tilted its head toward me. And you can actually see the golden crown, this little spot of yellow feathers up there. This is a Canada warbler. I really like this bird. Um, I've only seen it a few times. Uh, it is, uh, it migrates through the, the whole East Coast of the US, but it mostly spends its summers in Canada, hence the name, and um, winters in Central and South America. And uh, very nice bird. Uh, birders call that a necklace. The, uh, the, the pattern in it below its throat as a necklace. So we're toward the end of the trip and uh, we wound up by a, a river, a rapid river. And there's a, there's a species of duck called torrent duck that uses this habitat for uh, foraging for its food. And this is basically where it lives. It lives by fast moving rivers with lots of rocks on them and, um, and hunts for food there. And the males on the left, that's the white one and the females on the right. There was also a, a couple of juveniles that look more like the male because uh, they're, they're white with little black stripes. And they were nearby on the riverbank. And uh, I am, and this was taken from very far away, so that's why it's kind of grainy. And it was not a bright day. Here's a, the Peruvian racket tail I mentioned earlier in the program uh, that has the uh, this orangey. The legs, the boots on the legs are orangey. And uh, this is the female with no, uh, it doesn't have the racket tail. It's, and uh, here's the male with the tail. There's a black and white seed eater up at the top of the tree. Another bird that, that spends time in, in the rapids of rivers, and it's found mostly, well, exclusively in the Andes, uh, in elevations from around 900 meters up, uh, 
is the Andy, the White Cap Dipper. And it just walks on these on these rocks in these really treacherous streams and rivers and um, and can uh, hold on to the rocks and, and forage for food. Um, we have dippers in the US, in the Western US. Um, we have dippers. And uh, there's also dipper species in other parts of the world. But uh, we don't have them in the Eastern US, unfortunately. Tourmaline Sun Angel. I guess it's called tourmaline because tourmaline can have several different colors close together. And tourm the, the gem tourmaline can have lots of different colors together. And this bird sure does. And this is the long tailed self, which is the relative of the, of the uh, violet tailed self you saw earlier. It looks pretty much the same, but the tail is more blue than purple or than violet. Same bird, uh, same species, um, but I wanted to show you this view of the front where this patch of the forehead uh, glows at certain angles with the sun. And when you're watching these birds at feeders or out in nature, um, that, uh, that patch, it just catches the sun for very brief split seconds. And so it's like flashing off and on all the time. And you can't tell where you have to, where you need to look to see it or take a picture of it. So that's why I was, I was lucky to get one sitting on a branch and actually turning its head the right way to get that, that glow. Um, by the way, most of these structures on the branches, uh, the whitish ones are different kinds of lichen. And I believe the, the greenish ones with the spike, spiky look are little bromeliads, but I could be wrong about that. Uh, in Florida, we have lots of bromeliads that grow in trees like that, but I don't really know if those are bromeliads. Here's the Andean patu, believe it or not. Um, I needed to put this picture. This is another bird that, like the dipper and the, and the torrent duck, I didn't get great pictures, but they're special birds and I needed to, I got a picture, so I wanted to put it in here. Uh, patu is another type of bird in the, in the nightjar family. They also sleep during the day out in the open, uh, but they're camouflaged very well. And uh, <laughs> the patus mostly uh, tend to, instead of uh, sitting um, against, like instead of like lying down against a branch, like a lot of our nightjars do, uh, patus tend to stand up straight during the day. And very often they'll do it right at the end of a branch or they'll do it on a branch and in such a way that they look like another thick branch coming off of the tree and um, very hard to spot. And this one was way up in a tree that I would have never found on my own. The guide found it for us or somebody at the resort, at the uh, at this um, lodge, um, the Guango Lodge knew where it was and showed our guide or our guide knew where it was from previous days. And uh, cause they, they often perch in the same place day after day. And um, took me a while to even see it. It was probably, it was probably a hundred feet away up in the, and up in a tree that was about uh, 50 feet tall, something like that. Uh, I believe you can see the eye right here. Very often they close, they squint their eyes or close them during the day. So they're hard to see, but I believe you can see the eye here that's peeking between the leaf nodes here. And the tail is all the way down here. That's all, that's a long tail. Anyway, 
You can look that one up on your own. It's the Andean Patu. Um, here's a sword-billed hummingbird. Uh, another species that birders will love to see because it's got a very long beak uh, that's several, a bunch of inches long, probably uh, six inches long, maybe seven. And um, this was very dark. It was very dark at this lodge where I took this picture. Um, <clears throat> and um, there's lots of trees around. And again, I had a high ISO and everything you're supposed to do to get a good picture, but So, uh, and this is another picture that shows you, the other picture, it looks like the beat, the uh, bill was pointed away a little bit, so it didn't look as long as it really is. And in this picture, he was feeding, but I think like about another inch of the, of the beak is still in the feeder, maybe more. So uh, after our, most of our birding was over. We were in Quito, the capital, and spent the day seeing historic sites and, and uh, shopping. And Roz bought some textiles from this lady here. Oops. And they, there's a monument that's on the equator, because of course, the equator goes through Ecuador and it goes right through Quito. And so there's a monument and you can climb up this tower and take pictures off the top. And um, this is a view, uh, let's see, looking east and Northern hemisphere is on the left, as you can see from the end below. And the Southern hemisphere is on the right. And then the yellow line goes right up the middle. And if you see that white building in the, right in the distance there, a little like in the middle distance there. That's a church. And they told us people can get married there uh, and be in different hemispheres when they're getting married. And here we are on the equator. And that's the show. Hey, Larry. Excellent. Definitely. Thanks. <laughs> and everyone watching, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat now. Well, I'm glad that you got to go to Ecuador and uh, happy that you got to go before everything happened with the pandemic. And so were there a lot of other people traveling at the time and going on the tours? Well, Any group, I should not say. In my experience, not in my experience, because um, we, um, hmm. it's possible that we wouldn't know that because because we were on a trip that was mostly way out <laughs> where the birds are and not in the city, except for that day in Quito. And so if there are other travel groups around, we didn't really see them. Uh, it's been like that, like uh, we were able to travel some this year, did a, like two or three of them were birding trips. Um, and people were just starting to get out after the pandemic. And some of the countries we went to, well, the only international trip we did was to uh, Argentina and, and, uh, Peru, and uh, Argentina and Chile and uh, many places that were not tourists at all and that we were the first group to come after the pandemic. That was in November and early December. But um, really, on this trip, we didn't run into other tourists. And I don't know why that was. This, it, again, it was before the pandemic. OK. Was, what? Like Northern Hemisphere winter. So maybe mm -hmm. people just don't travel as much that time of year. I don't know. Mm, OK. So I do have a couple of questions for you. and. Uh, one is, 
about on average, how many shots does it take to get a good one of a hummingbird or a sylph when they're so fast moving? <laughs> well, hundreds, <laughs> hundreds, <laughs> really hundreds. Um, yeah, my this camera is old fashioned because it, it's a 2016 vintage camera. Um, and so that's about six years ago, seven, yeah, about six years ago. And um, takes 10, it can take 10 shots per second, 10 frames wow. per second. But uh, the newer mirrorless cameras, uh, they can take up to third, like 120 per second or something like that, absurd numbers. And um, so mine is only 10. So, but, you, but even so, it has a good buffer. Um, it's my camera's made for like sports and nature photography, so it has a good um, memory buffer, so that you can actually shoot theoretically for twenty seconds straight um, at fast um, at ten and ten at ten frames per second. You know, automatic repeating. So the theoretically, you could take twenty two hundred pictures in twenty seconds. So. Um, you know, that's that's how many pictures I was taking sometimes. And um, it takes a really long, a uh, lot of exposures to get. Uh, I think um, for my my big camera, I had about 10,000 exposures from this trip. 10,000 pictures. Wow. We have a great comment from Lizzie Stallman, and she said, great photos, memories of my trip with Sharon in 2017 hit a lot of the same locations. I highly recommend Ecuador to any birder who wants an immersive experience. The people and food are outstanding. Thanks, Lisi. Her name's pronounced Lisi. Ah, uh, Lisi. Sorry mm -hmm. about that, Lisi. No problem. <laughs> great. Another question I have is, what was the loudest bird species you heard? If hmm. it's a strange question, but I kind of think rainforest, maybe hear a lot of bird calls. And if there was something that really stood out to you, or maybe well, not the you, loudest, but different. Okay. I have distinct memories of a species that uh, I heard on a trip. And the reason I remember is because I wanted to see the bird really bad and I didn't. <laughs> We just heard it from a distance. And that was one of the mutt mutts. And um, I've been in tropical areas before and I love mutt mutts. And I heard mutt mutts and I didn't get to see them this time. So that's why I remember it because it was, was a loud call and it was a mutt mutt and I didn't see it. Okay. <laughs> that's what happened and on a Bernie trip. Sometimes you just don't yeah. see them. Mm hmm. And that was another question I had. What was any birds that you wanted to see that you weren't able to? Anything else besides the motma? Well, we saw the cock of the rock. That's one of the main ones. Uh, oh, uh, well, um, Indian condor. Um, I didn't take a picture. I didn't show a picture of that in this presentation. But we did see them. They were very far off um, when we saw them. They were. It was that first day when we were in the uh, near the volcano, and they were flying up very high. Uh, we could see them with binoculars, fine. But uh, I I got just pictures with they looked this big in the picture, and I could have shown them. But um, now since then, like I said, we were in Argentina and Chile in this just last year in uh, November after the pandemic, well, during the pandemic. And um, and uh, we had condors flying 40 feet over us and 75 condors on a, on a cliff, right on a cliff right in front of us. So um, got my condor fixed in November this of uh, 2021. But I, I, I mean, I got to see them on the, you know, on this uh, Ecuador trip from a distance. Uh, but that was good because uh, we had been in Peru and Machu Picchu um, in 2013, and um, that's way up in the Andes, and there are Andean condors there, and uh, I, we didn't see any. And the worst thing was we were on the train coming back from the trip 
to uh, Machu Picchu, going back towards um, Cusco. And there were two couples there, these two guys from New York and, the, and the, this, this couple from France. And both couples had pictures, and one of them had a video of the Andean condor in Machu Picchu that day. And, wow. and none of those other people were birders. <laughs> so we're the birders, and we didn't see them. Oh, so I was glad wow. to see them on this trip, this Ecuador trip. At least they were at a distance, but it was good. Excellent. That was a birder's story and bored most of you, but there you go. <laughs> no, it's fun because I would love to see the Andean condors. Uh, so I love that first picture of a night jar you saw. And have you seen them before? Well, not that species, but was it the, lo- the long tailed night jar? Well, that was a liar tailed night jar. Liar tear, yes. Liar tailed. Liar tailed. Um, well, no, I haven't seen them. No, I mean, that. I don't know the range of them, but they're probably just uh, in that part of South America. Um, we have a number of night jars in the States, but, uh, you know, like we have the whippoorwill. Uh, in Florida here, we have the, um, um, not the whippoorwill, the, uh, um, Whatever the the um, I don't know it's a, it's another species of of night jar that's more common here, um, and we've seen that one before. Um, and also there's um, common nighthawk, which is also seen flying around, and you can hear them sometimes in Central Florida. Um, and that that's another kind of night jar. Chuck Will's widow. That's the other one, the one that's in this area. And the way they um, sleep during the day is they, they just lay down flat on a branch. And we've seen Chuck Will's widows a few times. Um, we saw them on a field trip to Three Lakes um, to maybe six year, five, six years ago. Great. All right, I have another question. For people that aren't aware, what's the difference between a rainforest and a cloud forest? Altitude, mainly altitude. The cloud forests are up up high and the rainforests are down low. Uh, Both humid habitats. Both around the same amount of precipitation as well? I don't really know uh, about the quantity. they tend to be rather wet habitats in the cloud forest also, but I'm guessing it's a little bit less rain. Um, yeah, I don't know. But we, the, the habitats we were in in Ecuador on this particular trip are more, more, dis, are more aptly described as cloud forest, I believe. Mm-hmm. And I thought the views were beautiful. Did you have any issues with altitude sickness? We didn't. I mean, I um, on that eleven thousand foot hike in, at Papalacta at at um, Yanacocha Reserve. Um, it was we did a pretty long hike. It was several miles out out and back, probably five miles altogether, maybe more. And um, you know, I was. You know, I was breathing hard sometimes, but it wasn't too difficult. Good. And even at the 14,000 feet, we didn't stay there long, but um, at Papalacta Pass, it was 14,000 feet. Um, Roz and I do okay in altitude. Uh, Sometimes when we're going to be in altitude, we take medications for that. I don't think we did for this particular trip, although I might be wrong. We, we did for Peru, but I don't remember if we did for this. Trip. And uh, when you showed some of the pictures of the high altitude birds, it made me think, are many of them in danger due to climate change? I don't know the particular case of the birds we saw on that trip. Um, in, in Costa Rica, there's the... Um, Fame, the famous bird, the resplendent quetzal. Mm-hmm. People call them quetzals, but it's pronounced quetzal. And um, I know that their their numbers are declining. 
And those are mountain birds also. And they're being driven out just by climate change because the cold weather that they that they require, perhaps because of the trees that their food grows on, things like that. Um, they their their habitat on the mountains is decreasing because um, the warmer warmer weather keeps creeping up the mountain and changing the habitat. And so birds like that that depend on altitude for for their existence, you know, that's just where they evolved. Uh, probably many birds are, are probably in that predicament, but I'm, I don't know of any others at the moment. You know, I just don't happen to know of any. And uh, just a couple comments about some of the birds you had. I thought those red-headed barbets were funny and they had an interesting pose, the male and female in the beginning. They looked like they were squawking at each other. Yeah, they were in the same area, but uh, I don't know that they were talking to each other. It wasn't at the same. Um, I didn't see those two at exactly the same time. And uh, so I don't know what the deal was. Um, and uh, yeah, again, to get a bird in a pose like that, you have to take a lot of pictures because mostly the barbets, um, you just don't see them doing that. They're, they're, I have lots of other pictures of barbets, the same species with their mouths closed, you know, behaving. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so just not as interesting. And it just made me think uh, there were many different types of pittas and it them being called ant pittas. Is that because of their insect diet? They prefer ants? Yeah, you know about the uh, pitta part of it. I, I don't, I, I got to look that up, but, uh, but they're, they're eating insects in the forest floor a lot. Um, anything they can find, I think. Uh, there's in the tropics, there are entire groups of birds called ant pittas, ant wrens, ant shrikes. Um, did I say ant birds? There's ant birds, um, all different groups, and they're they're just they're distinct groups of birds. Most of them have a bunch of species that are that are in there that are that are included. Um, if you just look at a, bird, a book like you know a book like this, uh, it just can blow your mind because uh, there's so much variety. And I, like I said before, you can have tremendous variety of closely related birds of different species right in the same area. I mean, within a couple hundred feet of each other. It's, it's, if you haven't been in a far in a rainforest or a cloud forest like that, you don't get it because the density of habitat is so incredible that um, I, I used to think that you needed geographical separation for different species to evolve, you know, for a species to differentiate into two species, but in the rainforest, you might need, you know, like I said, 100 yards, 200 yards. And it's it's so dense and so rich in, in food and organisms and stuff like that. It's it's unbelievable. So you have all different kinds of woodpeckers running around that look, you know, in South America, there's so many woodpeckers that look similar to our pileated, the, like big, big woodpeckers like that. Uh, but a lot of species, some of them living in the same areas and just uh, some of them look very similar to the pileated other ones are like orangey, you know, colored or, or light tan, things like that. All in the same area. Great. And finally, do you have any advice for people that want to travel to this area? For example, worries about snakes or bugs or uh, mm -hmm. any general advice if you want to come to Ecuador for birding? When, uh, you know, um, I've been in, every time I've been in a rainforest, I've never had much problem with snakes or bugs. Um, we've seen some snakes. So we didn't, I don't remember seeing snakes in Ecuador. Um, you know, usually you're going to be walking on paths of some sort. Uh, so you're not going to be going out into a field or a, you know, where this waist high vegetation. Um, most snakes are 
trying to get out of your way. They're not trying to, they're, they're not, they have no reason to try to attack you. Um, the bugs haven't been bad either. Like uh, it's, it's uh, in Peru, we were in a rainforest, uh, a lowland rainforest. And the room we had uh, did not, one of the walls was in the lodge we stayed in. It was an eco lodge. One of the walls was missing. It was open to the, open to the forest, open to the rainforest. And wow. uh, we did have mosquito nets on the beds, but you know, otherwise we were not protected and we got very few mosquito bites or bug bites on that trip. Uh, we, of course, we, when we're out hiking, we are normally wearing long pants and long sleeves. So that helps a lot. Yeah, wear long pants and long sleeves a lot. Um, that, that helps. But as far as the snakes go, they're not out to get you, and you know, and you, and the main, the main thing to know about trips like this is go with a, a range of, go with a, go on a guided trip, go with a guide. You have to do that because otherwise you're going to be lost. You're not going to see one tenth of the species you would otherwise. Um, it would. It's you have to have a guide. It has to be a guided trip. I, I agree, especially they know the area, they know the birds, they could find everything for they you. They know the people, they know the birds, they know the, the resorts, you know, the, the lodges, they know the restaurants, they, they speak the language, they, you know, they, uh, uh, it's essential, in my opinion. To really have that uh, immersive experience, I agree, so... Well, you'll you'll be immersed if you don't have a guide, but you're not not probably not the kind of immersion you want. <laughs> you'll be immersed in a in a, a local dial local dialect dictionary, you know, <laughs> with your face in a in a, you know, uh, yeah, S special words to know in Quito, <laughs> that kind of thing. And you won't be yeah. seeing nature. <laughs> If you're going to the city, you know it's not that it's not that important. If you're going, if you're going to, you know, anywhere like you're going on a trip to go see Buenos Aires, you know, in Argentina or, you know, some place like that. I mean, I would I would have a guide at least for part of the trip, but it's not so essential. But if you're out in nature and you want to see birds, you want to see other species, you got to have a guide. Great. Well, Larry, thank you so much for the presentation today and for everyone joining us. And hopefully in the future, you can have another program because you've went to so many places and I, you know, I know you have a lot more pictures to share. So I yeah. really appreciate you doing the presentation this evening. Well, you're welcome. Thanks for hosting. <laughs> You're welcome. And as everyone can see, Larry's email address is here. So feel free to reach out to him if you have any questions. And do you have any last things you'd like to say, Larry, before we end it for the evening? Well, uh, yeah, Cassini Valley Audubon Society um, has been around since 1966. And um, we need uh, we need officers for the for the board that gets elected next month in April. So and and uh, other people, we need other board positions. So if you're capable of uh, volunteering some time with us, let Stephanie know or me. And uh, Stephanie's going to have to retire as president. So uh, we we need somebody else. So please reach out, and, everyone. And other positions. <laughs> Yes, please reach out. Uh, our email address is in the comments here. And uh, of course, you could reach us uh, through Facebook as well or on our website. There's everyone's email uh, also. So thank you, everyone, for joining us and have a safe evening. And we'll see you next month, which will be the fourth Tuesday of the month. So stay tuned for any updates of the link to watch. All right, everyone, take care. Bye. -bye.